Let's join our hearts together and enter in by the Spirit to our access to the Father. <clears throat> we pray, Jesus, that you would turn our coldness into communion this morning. Lord Jesus, we want to partake of the powers of the age to come. So show us, Lord God, lead us, br draw us into worshiping in spirit and in truth.
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down I know it because it's true You're never gonna let, never gonna let
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence, Lord God. Jesus. The Lord has really been putting on my heart that he wants us to get comfortable and used to doing things by the Spirit. And Zechariah 4 just keeps coming up in our meetings over and over. I would love to talk to other people that are in prayer and wonder who else is getting Zechariah 4 over and over and over, different parts of it. Of course, we know the one part, um, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. But also says the capstone will be brought out with shouts of grace, grace to it. There's so much in there, and I just want to refer you to it because it's been on the Spirit's mind as far as I understand it. So, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome. It's good to see all your shining faces here today. Uh, let me take a moment here and just uh, share a number of uh, announcements that we have. Lots going on, and that's always good. So let me just call your attention to a couple of things here. First of all, uh, as you know, uh, Dr. Benjamin's been doing uh, devotionals, uh, and then he took a break here for about a week. Uh, because he was starting uh, a new series uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, he's going to be uh, doing devotionals here uh, using the C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Uh, you'll be able to find a new video every weekday at 8 a.m. as usual, and every installment will be posted at kpc.org, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, this is a great opportunity to jump in and start participating with these devotionals if you haven't been able to be a part of it before. And of course, all his previous devotionals that he's written uh, himself uh, are also online as well. <clears throat> also, um, we want to invite you uh, to come and be a part of KPC's Celebration Orchestra. Uh, please consider joining uh, for our comeback rehearsal which will be on Wednesday, July 29th from 7 to 8.15 here in the sanctuary. Uh, KPC's Celebration Orchestra seeks both adults with at least two years of playing experience and students uh, grades uh, 6 through 12. Uh, this group provides an opportunity to develop your musical skills while glorifying and serving God. Uh, Celebration Orchestra accompanies vocal and choral groups. They also perform standalone pieces. Instruments include strings, woodwinds, brass, percussion, keyboards, and rhythm section. And in parentheses here it says, rhythm players must read music, okay? And uh, we'll be rehearsing um, uh, <clears throat> to uh, Nancy Klein's professional experience uh, in regard to safety guidelines. Uh, if you've been ill or been around others who've been sick, please refrain from joining us at this time. 
Uh, for additional information, you can contact the orchestra director, Larry Pat Donaldson, at bassoonplayers62 at gmail.com. And today, as we told you last week, our Har Harvest Network gathering uh, will be starting today immediately following the service. Um, uh, you can join us in Fellowship Hall immediately uh, after the service. Missions and Outreach Committee members will share specifics on how KPC impacts our local area and other countries worldwide. Uh, there is a box lunch uh, at, at the cost of $5 per person, and we'll need to limit the intent attendance to the first 40 people who come through the door. Okay, we have to do that in order to keep our distancing and uh, protect everybody. Also, we've told you before as well that the River Wave Death Community Church or Death Church will begin uh, uh, <clears throat> on the 19th, uh, and we're pl pleased to be hosting uh, River Wave. Uh, they will meet on Sundays at 2 p.m. in the celebration room. This is a ministry of the hearing impaired to the hearing impaired uh, with services specifically tailored to their uh, members' needs. Please be in prayer for them and help to get the word out about the service. If you have neighbors or uh, you know of friends or friends of friends that are hearing impaired, uh, we would love to have you encourage, uh, to encourage them to come and be a part of this very special ministry. Then. Uh, Finally, we have the children's ministry, which uh, it begins today, and this is uh, for nursery through age 12. Uh, it's back in full swing uh, today, and uh, if you came today and weren't aware that it started, uh, you can send your uh, children here uh, through the door and uh, to class, uh, but also get the word out that the children's ministry has started back and we invite all families to come and participate and we'll make sure that your children are protected. All right, we got uh, our offering um, coming up here and we've got a special uh, ministry here that's uh, going to be a part of us here. We've got uh, the Hands of Praise led by Dodie Antall and yes, absolutely. Also, uh, uh, we got a special backup here uh, with us, a new group. Uh, got a whole new band here working with us this morning here for the Hands of Praise. The band's called Free For All. I love that name. What a great name, Free For All. Okay, we got uh, Kayla on keyboard. We've got uh, Paul on guitar, Carl on bass, and Rick on drums. And uh, we got the songs uh, here. Uh, uh, shared with us by the uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Klein family singers here. You all know them, right? Okay, good enough. Let's uh, pray here for our offering, if we can. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and worship you, Lord. Uh, Lord, uh, our joy is so great when we're able to come together and gather as your body and to uh, just to experience your spirit upon us, Lord, and to hear your word, Lord. And Lord, we lift up our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us, Lord. And Lord, I want to pray uh, specifically here uh, uh, for um, uh, Gordon Matheson, Lord, for his healing. Uh, just a great man of prayer, and I just uh, pray for strength and healing for him as well. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we just pray here for your blessings upon him. And Lord, we give of our tithes of offerings again because we love you, uh, not because we have to, but because uh, we just know of your grace and your mercy, uh, your healing power, and all that you provide for us. So we desire to bless you this day. We pray in your precious name. Amen. us today because he is an awesome God. Stand to your feet. He's worthy.
I get some sound, good. Okay, uh, as Dr. Benjamin's coming up, uh, uh, preparing for his sermon, uh, just a quick announcement. Um, the uh, deacon, one of the deacons found some money that somebody had dropped going into the doorway of celebration. If you reach in your pocket or purse and realize that you're short some money, uh, the deacons have it out in the hall, uh, or you can leave it and they'll put an offering, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, we just wanted to let you know about that. We don't want you to be without your money. Testing, one, two, we're good. Uh, <clears throat> if you've noticed we're having trouble with the screen, actually, we are having trouble with our internet provider. They keep going out on us on Sunday mornings. So if you know some people that were watching and got cut off, uh, that's our internet provider doing that. Um, <clears throat> hopefully we can get that fixed in the future. We're going to try and have, at least today, I think we're still, they anticipate we can still have lyrics and scriptures up there. Um, <clears throat> but you, you need to understand, they take all the signals, mix it all together, send it to Facebook, and from there to, to uh, uh, YouTube for the website, but then from Facebook it comes back here. So if the internet goes out, our own internal communications here between the back of the, the balcony and the screen get interrupted. So <clears throat> apologies for that, and I hope we can finally get that fixed. Finally get that fixed. Today I want to share with you some thoughts and insights um, that I've been thinking about mulling over for, for a while. I'm actually in the process of writing a book on it. No, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you here. I want to share some ideas with you. Uh, that are the foundation of that study I'm working on in a sermon entitled, Not From Here, Not From Here. Let's have a prayer. Lord, as we come, I just ask that you would give me the words to speak and the spirit in which to say them that you would give us ears to hear and receive and the heart to understand what it is the Spirit is trying to say to us today through your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. All God's people said, amen. amen. Well, that part of the communication is still working, you know, okay. Not from here. It was a uh, middle-aged couple uh, maybe early to mid-60s, from Pennsylvania. They were transplanted down here to a small uh, South Georgia town. It was my first time in the pulpit. I was doing a trial sermon for the pastor search committee, and there had been a pretty good turnout for this little church, maybe 40 in worship. I was shaking hands at the door after the service. You know, everyone wanted to make sure I knew who they were, you know, in a nutshell. And as I met this couple, he quickly explained that he retired after 30 years with the Postal Service, and uh, he had headed south to get away from the cold. His wife added that they were the newest members of the church. She said, we're not from here. We're just newcomers. We've only been here 12 years. <laughs> only 12 years. It's a chronic, 
problem I run into in one church after another. With all the different ministries and ways I've served churches, this is by now my 20th church, and I've run into it in some measure in every one of them. A congregation made up mostly of old-timers who aren't necessarily all that old, but who have long-time roots in the community or long-time roots in that congregation. They are from here. And then there's a handful, or sometimes more, of newcomers who are not from here and who still feel like newcomers and are still treated like outsiders after 10, 12, even 20 years. And the funny thing is, every one of those churches thinks of itself as a friendly and welcoming congregation. What are we doing wrong? Early in my ministry, I just figured this was a modern problem, maybe even a characteristically southern problem. I learned for the, I longed for that simple unity and the undisturbed fellowship of the early church. I mean, they managed to be of, like Luke says, of one heart and soul. Why can't we? What was their secret? And how can I, as a pastor, recreate the closeness and spiritual warmth of those first followers of Jesus in Florida or in Georgia or South Carolina or North Carolina or, or Virginia? You may have wondered the same thing. So follow along with me as we read from the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, in the first, oh, I think it's ten verses, eight or ten verses, <laughs> I lose track. Um, maybe we'll just do six verses, but anyway. We'll start from chapter, in chapter 6 of Acts, we'll start at verse 1 and we stop when we stop. How about that? Now, during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, now it's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. Now, what they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a, pros a proselyte of Antioch. And they had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, when you and I read this passage in particular, and every time I ever heard it preached on, we usually focus on how the apostles established the office of deacon, entrusted with waiting tables. That's what deacon means, is a table waiter who were responsible for managing the financial affairs of the church and providing for the poor, handling charity. However, in the process, we have missed 
that they are never actually called deacons. They're called instead the seven. And Luke later calls Philip one of the seven. That's in Acts 21. So it's the institution, it's not so much an institution of deacons, it is an institution of the seven. And the seven are never described as actually performing charity and administration, but they are firebrand preachers, and they're visionaries, they're miracle workers, just like the twelve. So let's look beneath the surface to see what's really going on here in this passage. Now first, we're told that some folks in the church were complaining. The word can also mean grumbling. Complaining sounds so much nicer than grump. Complaining can sound a little whiny, but grumbling sounds somehow ominous, but it's the same word in Greek. They were grumbling. They were fussing among themselves. See, up to this point, the first Christians have been worshiping together every day. They've been sharing their food in their homes. They've been pooling their money and their property to provide for one another. They've had their problems, but so far, all of the trouble has been caused by persecution from outside, from the Jewish authorities. The church itself has been a model community, peacefully, happily coexisting in faith, in love, and in prayer. It's an undisturbed fellowship. So it's surprising to hear about rumblings under the placid surface, but there are. Now, Luke doesn't tell us much about what they were grumbling about, and some suspicious scholars <clears throat> uh, insinuate that Luke was, in, he was intentionally suppressing the juicy details, you know. He didn't want to admit that Christians had any conflicts. And other scholars wonder if, well, if Luke, writing decades later, even understood what the fight was all about. But those are just the ruminations of armchair historians, frustrated because, well, had they lived then, knowing what they know now, they would have written a very different work than Luke did. Well, the thing is, Luke was not trying to write a history of the church. He was, if, you, if he was writing history at all, he was writing the history of the gospel and how it spread across the world. How, by the power of the Spirit, the gospel began in Jerusalem and then spread through Judea and Samaria and across the Mediterranean world all the way to the capital of the then known world, Rome. He tells us about this internal kerfluffle at all because it introduces us to Stephen, the first Christian martyr, whose story he's about to tell us in the rest of chapter 6 and in chapter 7, and to tell us about the evangelist Philip, who brings the gospel on its next step to Judea and Samaria and the coastal region of Palestine in chapter 8. But for the early Christians who originally experienced and passed down this story, this had been a serious conflict. It was a real problem, and it had lasting consequences. The story that Luke passes on to us here tells us how within the first three years of the church, 
there emerged two clear factions. The first called the Hebrews and the other the Hellenists. Who are they? Well, one thing we can eliminate is that it does not mean Hebrew meaning Jewish Christians versus Hellenist meaning Greek in the sense of Gentile Christians, because at this early stage in the church, they're all Jews. They're all Jews who have come to believe in the Messiah Jesus. So, this is not an ethnic distinction. It is a linguistic distinction. Are you with me? We've got Hebrews, they're called, and Hellenists. There are two groups separated by language. Now, the Hebrews were those church people who spoke only Aramaic, which was the Hebrew dialect of the time, the vernacular there in the first century. And I prefer, just to make this a little clearer, to call them Hebraists, okay? The Hebraists, because they were Hebrew talkers, Aramaic speakers. The Hellenists, on the other hand, were also Jewish Christian believers who spoke mainly Greek. Most of them could probably read a little, they could read some biblical Hebrew. They might speak enough Aramaic to get by down at the local bakery. But their primary language, the one they grew up speaking, was Greek. So obviously, of course, speaking two different languages could lead to communication problems in the early church, and it did. But their language barrier tells us something else far more significant. The Hebraists, who spoke only Aramaic, appear to have had to have been from Palestine, that is, Jerusalem, Judea, southern Galilee. They had been born here. They'd always been here. They'd never been any place else, certainly no place where they had had, would have had to have learned Greek. They existed completely within an Aramaic-speaking environment, The life and the customs in Palestine were what they had grown up with. It was all they knew. This is just the way things have always been. Their school classmates were still here, their kin, all their church friends, and they were completely invested in the local community. They were what I shall call old timers, because you were, you see, They were from here. They were from here. The Greek-speaking Hellenists, on the other hand, were Jews who had been born and grown up out in the diaspora, in the Jewish enclaves scattered across the Mediterranean world, in, say, Alexandria or Cyprus, or Antioch, or Ephesus, or Rome. They'd been to other places. They'd seen other things where people did things in different ways. They had come to Jerusalem perhaps on pilgrimage, or they might have moved here as an adult for whatever reason, maybe to be closer to their aging relatives or to connect with their roots, or simply to get away from the cold. They were newcomers. They were not from here. So from the very beginning, the first church of Jesus was made up of Christians who were from here and others who were not from here. Now, for a while, it didn't matter. Everyone was caught up in the first flush of the new life 
the, the excitement of revival and seeing more and more people coming in and coming to believe in Jesus. There's an excitement that happens when revival is going on where people don't notice the little details. But over time, eventually, the cracks begin to show. And because, by the way, because we're people, cracks are always there, right? Because if I'm not cracked, you certainly are. If, if it's a hard truth, <laughs> we are all cracked, a little bit cracked. And those cracks are going to start showing. When Peter then tells the Hellenists, the Greek talkers, to pick seven leaders from among their, themselves. And I want you to notice that those seven names, the seven men they pick, without exception, are not Hebrew names, but they are Greek names. These are all, all seven of them are Greek talkers. They're all Hellenists from that faction in the church. He's basically, Peter is basically acknowledging that there exists not one undivided church, but two distinct churches operating in different languages under the same umbrella. Now, what that brought this conflict to a head was the congregation's daily distribution of charity. Judaism had always shown concern for handicapped beggars, for transients, for widows, for orphans, and Jerusalem had a disproportionate number of widows because, you see, it was customary, if you could, if you could afford to, it was customary, you know, if you, if you survived to retirement age, to move to Jerusalem and to spend your last years in Jerusalem so when you would die in Jerusalem and would be buried in Jerusalem. And then, as now, wives, if they made it through childbirth and all of that, wives tended to outlive their husbands. So there were a lot more widows than you would naturally expect in Jerusalem. And so there in Jerusalem, the temple maintained two charitable distributions of food and clothing. The one was a daily distribution rather like our soup kitchens, and the other was a weekly distribution of food and clothing, a lot like our food pantries and clothes closets. In analogy to this, the early church developed its own system of daily aid to provide for its poor and widows. Now we're told the Hellenists were grumbling because the widows among them were being neglected. And the solution was to pick some Hellenist leaders to manage their own affairs. Now, this is very telling. What this reveals is that up to this moment, the Hellenists had had no say over who or who didn't receive assistance. Can you see that? Can you see that? The administration and the distribution of charity, what we would call the Finance and Congregational Care Committee, was completely controlled by somebody else. The Hebraists, the old timers, who were from here. Now, we don't hear about any of the Hebraists grumbling because, you see, their widows were definitely not being neglected. They made sure 
they were taking care of their own. These were widows they had known their whole lives. I mean, they were from here. They knew these people. They, they were their friends, might even be their relatives. The old timers, they were going to make sure their people whom they knew got taken care of. But the old timers were not so diligent about caring for those newcomers. Do you see it? Talk to me. Yeah. Now, this is not to say that the old timers were leaving the newcomers out on purpose. I mean, they didn't speak the same language. And if for that reason alone, they likely didn't attend the same Bible studies or the same prayer meetings. They probably didn't know them that well, if at all. They might know their faces, you know, from the big worship services down at Solomon's portico in the temple, but those are just faces in a crowd. They certainly wouldn't have known their names. It would be a couple of millennia before the existence of pictorial church directories. And even we've been having trouble getting ours finished, you know? So even if it was unintentional on the part of the old timers, the newcomers were being left out and made to feel like outsiders and second-class church members. No wonder they grumbled. Now, every church says it wants to grow. They have annual revival or homecoming or some other outreach strategy. They say they want a pastor who has a heart for the lost, who will lead them to Christ, who reaches out to young families with children, a pastor who can grow the church. But there are two parts to growing a church. The first is you open the front door. The second is you close the back door. On the one hand, you reach out to attract new members, to lead them to Christ. If it's a charismatic church like here, to teach them about the Holy Spirit and lead them into the baptism of the Spirit and the experience of the gifts and so forth. But on the other hand, <clears throat> You need to keep them. You know, assimilate them into the life and the organization of the congregation until they make friends, until they're connected, until they find a meaningful task and feel like they really belong. You see, when people attend a church, and you'll hear this from me often, when people attend a church for the first time, they're looking for two things. Two things. The first is they want to sense the nearness of God. They want to know, kind of have that gut intuitive sense that God is really there and, and he's, he's there. That aha moment. And the second thing is to feel like they're part of a family where they are included and can make a significant contribution. Being included, welcomed, included, and part of that is making a significant con contribution. Make them feel like outsiders. You deny them a say, and what's going to happen? They'll look elsewhere, and you can't blame them. So the toughest challenge for most churches that I've seen is removing the barriers that unintentionally push people away. Those, you know, the ingrained attitudes, 
the practices that neglect or exclude them, that make them feel like they have no say, that treat them like second-class members, that deny them a significant contribution. And we may not even realize we're doing it. Let me give you one horror story. I have a, a big chunk of the book I'm writing on, on this is comprised of horror stories. I have seen or experienced many, and it's sad. But in one congregation I served, the entire church programming, from Sunday school, children's activities, youth activities, even adult church suppers and everything, everything was handled by one large committee. I think they had 14 members on that committee. One large committee, and they had an ironclad committee membership policy. You had, if you were to be on that committee, you had to, one, be a church member, okay? Two, you had to actively support the church's programs for at least two full years as a passive participant, spectator. And three, you had to be personally invited by the committee chairperson to serve. Of course, in reality, only old-timers who were from here were ever invited because, you see, they didn't feel they could trust the newcomers who weren't from here to toe the line and do things the way they had always been done and the way they were told to do them. Now, that church considered it to be itself to be a friendly and welcoming church and wondered why they could never keep new members. Can you guess? Peter's solution was to have them all come in and give the newcomers leadership roles. You know, put the newcomers in charge of outreach and assimilation. You know, your brother and sisters who are new to the church, they know best what it feels like to be new. They know how, how important it is to be genuinely uh, welcomed and included in Christ. They've been through that. <clears throat> who better to spearhead assimilating new members into the life of the church and helping them find their slot where they can serve, but the people who have been there and walked through that. One day, when we stand before the Lord, will He commend us? Will He? Will He say, I was naked and you clothed me? I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick or in prison, and you visited me. I was new, and you welcomed me. I was not from here, and you made me feel like I really belonged. Now, no church starts out planning to become an insider clique of old-timers from here. It evolves gradually, right up under our noses where we can't really see it. I get involved in the life of a congregation, maybe in a small, tightly knit group, whether that, and that varies from place to place, it might be the women's circle, it might be, might be the chancel choir, it might be my home cell group, or whatever pastor's Bible study, and we get to know each other. We become friends and confidants. These become the church people I keep on speed dial. 
They're the first ones I turn to for whatever. Over time, I carve out a niche of what I enjoy doing or feel I'm good at around church. Maybe it's the building and grounds committee. Maybe it's worship. Maybe it's decorating for the ladies' luncheons. Maybe it's the nursery, whatever. The first people that I will tend to turn to are my people because that's who I know. I might try to include a few others from time to time, and I discover which ones I can trust to get the job done and which ones may not be quite so reliable. And I end up with a short list of the folks I think I can depend on that I know, and we develop over time our way of doing things. You all know about our way of doing things here? Yeah, every church has got it. Every church, it just is. It's a, it's a people thing. It's a people thing. We have developed our way of doing things. Why do we do that? Because it's convenient and we know what to do. If we start changing things up, we have to stop and think about it. And most of us, that's a lot of work or it feels like work if you have to stop and think about it, right? So we do it the way we've always done it because we know instinctively what needs to get done and how to do it and who to call. And that way we can get everything done swiftly and reliably like a well-oiled machine. Isn't that true? I hear a few begrudging amens out there. Yeah, no, that's what we do. We want that well-oiled machine feeling. But the problem is my well-oiled machine may not have much room for any new spare parts. And the bigger the congregation, the more work will come to be shouldered by small cliques of trusted friends. It's inevitable. That's just the way people work. And this is fine as long as the cliques remain open, willing to reach out and take the risk of, of bringing in new and untested participants. But I think you can also see how easily such cliques can become closed. Not on purpose, simply out of practicality. I may not have time to experiment with new folks. I may not trust new folks to do things the way we've become used to doing them. And quite frankly, I might not have the opportunity or willingness to even meet a lot of newcomers. In my little circle, and everything we're doing, is closed. Well, we say, well, okay, but of course this, this process takes a long time to crystallize, right? Well, if the tension between the Hebraists and the Hellenists is any indication, it can emerge in within as little as three years of the inception of a congregation. Within three years, that's all it takes. If you drop a newcomer who's not from here into the middle of a church whose cliques of old timers are simply used to doing everything, <clears throat> Your average newcomer, no matter how, they, how much they might enjoy this or that program or activity, they simply won't see any constructive contribution that he or she can make. They're ignored or neglected 
And if that happens for long enough, and especially if he or she has been actively rebuffed, they're going to go elsewhere. Now, when I mention actively rebuffed, there are old timers in every congregation of every denomination has them. But there are some old timers who have been at this doing the same things for so long that he or she feels uniquely entitled to be in control and to have the say. Do you know what I'm talking about? No names, please. (laughs) But every church has them. And when you have people that feel entitled to be in control and entitled to tell people what they can or can't do, you're going to be systematically running off all your newcomers. It's what some church growth specialists call the bulldog at the door. It's going to run off newcomers. This is just a human thing that every church has to deal with. And if a congregation wants to remain healthy, it has to become intentional. Intentional. Let me say that one more word. Intentional about identifying and including and assimilating new blood into the activities and the leadership of the church. During this period, where we are right now in this church's life, where so many activities have to remain on hold because of the pandemic, this is really an excellent time for teams and leadership cliques and so forth to to, uh, rethink what we're doing and who is involved, and even more importantly, who is not being involved, who's getting left out, and who could be brought in somewhere. I cannot stress how important this is for the long-term life of this and every congregation. We will... We'll never be sure if the appointment of the seven solved the discourse, the discord in Jerusalem. Shortly thereafter, Stephen was murdered by a violent mob, and the rest of the Hellenists fled. The Hebraists, who were who spoke the language and were part of the given social network in town, even if they were a little bit suspect because they were Jesus followers, they were still some of us. They were one of us in the local Jewish society and culture there. They were not hunted. We know because they continued to live and worship in Jerusalem in relative peace for at least another decade. The Hellenists, though, who were hunted and pursued, scattered across the then known world. Philip began evangelizing in Samaria and in Gaza. Ananias began, went to Damascus and began a church there. Some of them transplanted to Syrian Antioch, quite likely including one of the seven, a Jewish proselyte from Antioch named Nicholas. It was the newcomers who were unencumbered by the old ways of doing things and who were now free of any social pressure from the old guard who were best suited to bring the gospel to the Jews, they spread across the Greek-speaking world. 
And, and new congregations began popping up all over. And these were the people who also eventually preached with great success to the Greek-speaking non-Jews, the Gentiles. It was they, these newcomers, who, who ensured not only the survival of the church, but the evangelization of the then known world. You and I owe our faith and the, our existence as a church to the newcomers. The continued story of the Hebraists, however, is a cautionary tale to us, and I hope we'll hear it, about what can happen when old-timers get a stranglehold on the church. The Hebraists held on in Jerusalem for another, oh, 30 years. Pretty soon, though, they exhausted their circle of immediate acquaintances to evangelize, so they appear to have pretty well plateaued in membership and begun to stagnate. They repeatedly had to rely on financial support from the new flourishing Hellenist churches that Paul and others were founding across the Roman Empire. Of course, the old-timers there kept agitating to pressure the, the other Hellenist churches to be more like them and do things the way they've always done things. But they met with increasingly staunch resistance. Gradually, the Jerusalem old-timers lost influence and were effectively ignored by the greater church. Shortly before the Jewish war broke out, around 62 AD, their leader, James, the brother of Jesus, was also murdered by a mob. And the small Jerusalem church fled from, from the city and went across the Jordan to the village of Pella. They never went back. With their homes destroyed by the Romans, the temple in ruins, they lost their ties to the traditions and the community they had depended on for all these years, and they languished. Over the next 40 or 50 years, they dwindled and dwindled away until, at the last, there in the Jordanian wilderness, the church of the Hebraist old-timers simply died out. Let's pray. Lord, we need help even from the very beginnings of your church, there's been a struggle between our very human ways of doing things and the way you want us to do things. And it makes sense and it's understandable and it's all very, well, very human. And yet how self-destructive to your church. We ask, Lord, that we might rise above that and be a greater church, one that's open, one that's welcoming, one that brings people in, loves them into the faith, and then finds ways that they can work and serve and make friends and become a part of a faith community. And if it means, Lord, sometimes we have to be willing to do th something differently than the way we've always done it, then, Lord, so be it, because love is more important than habit. 
And may in all of it, the gospel of Jesus Christ be spread, the power of the Holy Spirit be at work and manifest, and the glory of God Almighty be our goal. In the name of our Lord and Savior, we ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Will you stand and sing with us, The Church is One Foundation? As you go, never forget, we were strangers and aliens and have been made citizens and members of the household of God. In case there is any question, when it comes to the kingdom of God, none of us are from here. Every one of us is a newcomer. So go and find some more newcomers. Because I guarantee you, the banquet table is not filled yet. And in that kingdom, you do not have to maintain six feet of distance. And in that kingdom, you do not have to figure out how to eat with your mask on. So speak to somebody today, even if you have to do it as a dis- at a distance. But share the gospel. It can be as simple as, you know, the Lord really loves you and he's looking out for you. That may be the word they need to hear. You might want to sit down and write a letter to your grandchildren and tell them how you came to know Jesus, because I bet they don't know how you came to know Jesus Christ. And that letter... They might not know what to do with it now, but I promise you they'll keep it, and one day it will bear fruit for them and maybe for their children and their children's children. Tell somebody. Reach out. If you're on a committee, if you're on a task force in the church, 
get on the phone or do some texting or have a little Zoom meeting, how can we find some new people, some new blood to get in here so we can make some new friends and they can make new friends? We can be friends to them. That's the challenge. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and throughout this week to come and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.